Hello everyone, welcome to IAS Baba's 60 days rapid revision series for prelims 2022. This is day 54 and we are taking up environment and ecology. So basically the indices and reports. So those will be the topics of discussion. And coming to the guessworks as usual, which one of the following in Indian polity is an essential feature that indicates that it is federal in character. So we had discussed this at the very first of our class. So it is like the independence of judiciary has nothing to do with the federalism. We will strike it down. Then the union legislature has elected representatives from the constituent units. So this might appear, so we will keep it. Then the union cabinet can have elected representatives from regional parties. Then the fundamental rights are enforceable by courts of law. So this has nothing to do. So we have the B and C friends here. So search for words that are synonymous for federalism. So in that perspective, regional parties, so they will be. So as we have already discussed, so if a cabinet is willing to take a regional party person into its cabinet, so that means they are willing to listen to the state's voice. So that means there is a good center state relation and a good federalism thrives only when there is a good center state relation and a good federal system will have a good center state relation. So thereby C will be the correct option. Then come to next, which one of the following best defines the term state? So a community of persons permanently occupying a defined territory independent of external control possessing an organized environment. So independent of external control. So that means the sovereignty and politically organized people of a definite territory and possessing an authority over to govern them and maintain law and order, protect their natural rights and safeguard their means of sustenance. Then a number of persons who have been living in a definite territory for a very long time with their own culture, tradition and government and a society permanently living in a definite area with a central authority and executive responsible to the central authority and an independent judiciary. So friends here, state is something a legal word. So we cannot link that with the culture, tradition and others. So C will be struck down. And then friends, state is something which is more related to the people, not just the central authority or the centralized government. So here the executive, judiciary and all are nothing if we neglect the people. So we strike it down. So here we are left with either A or B. So A says about sovereignty. But B says much more than sovereignty. So here if you take the concentric circles. So here the first option it speaks of sovereignty. The second one sovereignty plus the welfare state. So if you take the welfare state as an option. So B will be the most probable answer. But there are confusions as well friends. So if you go with the definition with the NCRTs and all. So A is already given in NCRT as a definition of state. But overall comprehensive meaning if you consider. So B will be the correct option. So here we don't know. So we will check from the UPSC's official answer key. But the thing is that UPSC releases answer key after prelims. So here we will go with the whatever human capability we have. So if there is a definition that is more evolved than whatever given in the NCRT, so we should accept that. So NCRT can be the reasonable benchmark, but we cannot say that they are the only exclusive benchmarks. So everyone knows that NCRTs are the basic ones. So as and when the definition evolves, so let us consider an evolved definition. So B will be the most probable one. But however, if UPSC releases answer key, we will check from that as soon as possible. Then with reference to Indian judiciary, consider the following statements. Any retired judge of Supreme Court of India can be called back to sit by the Chief Justice of India with prior permission of the President of India. And a High Court in India has the power to review its own judgment as the Supreme Court does. So friends, an easy question. So anyone who has a basic knowledge on quality, he can hit it. So both one and two. Then come to next. With reference to India, consider the following statements. There is only one citizenship and one domicile. And citizen by birth only can become the head of the state. And foreigner once granted citizenship cannot be deprived of it under any circumstances. Friends, it is an easy question. So if you go as per the constitution. So for the qualification of president, the thing is mentioned. And even in the guesswork, say for example, the head of the state is president. But however, even prime minister is equivalent. And we take the example of Manmohan Singh who was born in Pakistan, but he went on to become the Prime Minister. So if that is possible, even constitution will allow it for the president post as well. So a crude guess and only is also extreme. And here cannot deprive at any circumstances. So this is extreme again. So that means it is not like a foreigner will come here and he will commit crimes. So three is also not possible. So if we exclude three, so anyway C and D are eliminated and we are left with A and B. And here to be eliminated and one only is the answer. Not so difficult a question. Then which of the following factors constitute the best safeguard of liberty in a liberal democracy? So here a committed judiciary, then centralization of powers, then elected representatives and separation of powers. Friends, this question also we have discussed. So the committed judiciary, the word committed, so that is not having a proper meaning. 
so in second erc and in other legal documents so that committed bureaucracy means the bureaucracy that is having a nexus with the politicians that is if the politicians order them to walk so they are ready to crawl and they are ready to do any kind of activities be it legal or illegal or ethical or unethical on the behest of political masters so if you consider that we can eliminate a friends actually this is more a threat to the liberty so if a centralized authority like kim jong un of north korea is there so he will curb the liberty at any cost then elected government so friends here elected government and separation of powers these two stand to become the true competitors for this and here elected government means say for example we are an elected government but once the election is over so for the next 5 years of the tenure the government can come up with any laws or legislations but separation of powers means so here we will be having independent judiciary so independent judiciary will be having a complete track on the executive and legislature in every moment so this is more formidable compared to the c so we go with d as the option so these are some of the guessworks then coming to the concepts so emission gap report 2021 emissions gap report was released by the united nations environment program so mark this as important unep and it provides an overview of emission gap that is the difference between where greenhouse gas emissions are predicted to be in 2030 and where they should be to avoid the worst impacts of the climate change so going with the current trend where they will go and where they should be so the difference is the emission gap report and here the report says there is a limited impact on the new ndcs for the 2030 so we know that most of the nations have come up with the new nationally determined contributions for the year 2030 and here there is limited impact on the new ndcs for the 2030 so that means most of the nations they have come up with the new nationally determined contributions for the 2030 and these targets so they are projected to reduce 2030 emissions by only 7.5% resulting in a warming of 2.7 degrees celsius friends we have been fighting to stop the emission so that the temperature will never cross 2 degrees celsius but if 2.7 degrees is occurring so then the targets are of no use and here if you go with the trend so this 2.7 is slightly more than 3 degrees celsius that unep has forecast so that is even if you go with the current 2030 targets which the ndcs are depicting so even then we will be having 2.7 degree celsius rise in temperature then emissions reductions are needed so 30% cut in emissions is required to limit the warming to 2 degree celsius and a 55% cut is required to limit it to 1.5 degree celsius so a huge cut is required that is what the report says then the current net zero targets could limit the global warming to around 2.2 degree celsius by the century's end so by 2100 so we will be having 2.2 degree celsius if you go with the net zero targets then the reduction of methane emissions from the fossil fuel waste and agriculture sectors could help close the emission gap in the short term so that means methane is a major contributor to the global warming and if we curb the emission of methane so we can achieve the targets easily then the covid-19 pandemic led to an unprecedented 5.4% drop in the global carbon dioxide emissions in 2020 so covid-19 has helped in reducing the co2 emission by 5.4% then a strong rebound in the emissions is expected in 2021 because throughout the world the lockdown is being opening so we can expect that so friends here for us from the prelims perspective so mark whether there is any statistic that is extreme and if it is not extreme so you need not remember but remember that emission gaps report is submitted by the unep so that is more than sufficient for us so be prudent and give importance where it is ought to be given then come to next the adoption gap report so the report was released by unep again so remember the adoption gap and the emissions gap report both by unep and report assesses national and global progress on adoption so here it is like how we adopt to the current temperature how we adopt our lifestyle so that we will emit minimum carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases and it covers three central elements that is planning financing and implementation so in all these stages adoption is looked into and key highlights around 79% of countries have adopted at least one national level adoption planning instrument and this is an increase of 7% since 2020 so that means earlier it was 72% and now 79% of the countries so they have adopted adoption plan so the number of countries who are adopting the adoption plan so that is being increasing then adoption costs in developing countries are 5 to 10 times greater than the current finance flows so we know that there is a finance flow that is occurring between the developed and the developing countries but going with the current flow that is the way the developed countries are funding the developing countries so in that so the cost required to adopt for the developing countries is 5 to 10 times more so that means they are giving 5 to 10 times less than 
whatever the required fund is so that if you remember it is more than sufficient then more highlights that this adaptation finance gap is larger than indicated in 2020 and is widening so that means the developed nations are crunching the funds day by day they are not increasing so that is why the gap increases then opportunities provided by covid-19 recovery stimulus packages for green and resilient recoveries are not currently being realized so that means covid-19 gave some stimulus and it gave some time but that is not being utilized so whatever advantage covid-19 gave so all is being utilized within no time so here again friends remember if there are any extreme statistics and remember that adoption gap report is being given by UNEP then the greenhouse gas bulletin world meteorological organization recently released the greenhouse gas bulletin so remember the organization then the key highlights concentration of co2 so here the concentration of co2 reached 413.2 parts per million in 2020 and is 149 percent the pre-industrial level so this 149 percent is huge and it is extreme data so mark this as important then methane is 262 percent and nitrogen dioxide is 123 percent the levels in 1750 so again very much extreme and from 1990 to 2020 radiative forcing by long-lived greenhouse gas increased by 47 percent so radiative forcing means the climate effects of global warming so now from 1990 to 2020 the climate change and the effect of global warming so that has been increased by 47 percent so that means the erratic rains the frequent change in the temperatures so all these have been increasing and with co2 accounting for about 80 percent of this increase that is co2 is the major contributor then the numbers are based on monitoring by world meteorological organizations global atmosphere watch network so remember global atmosphere watch network is an organization within wmo then come to next the clida bank declaration for green shipping corridors so here a coalition of 22 countries have agreed to create net zero emission shipping trade routes between the ports to speed up the decarbonization of global marine industry so even in the marine industry the awareness about environment is growing so that is why the green shipping corridors are being thought out and the signatory countries signed the clida bank declaration for green shipping corridors and this was launched in the cop26 that is the glasgow summit of unfcc then the members agreed to support the establishment of at least six green corridors by 2025 and a green corridor is a shipping route between two major port hubs on which the technical economical and regulatory feasibility of zero emissions is accelerated so mainly green corridor means so where there is less carbon footprint or might be trying for zero carbon footprint so remember clida bank declaration and also remember the 22 countries coalition and also remember what is a green corridor then come to next the global resilience index initiative so this is released by a consortium of various organizations that is insurance development forum then coalition for climate resilient investment and then coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure then gm foundation and uk center for green finance and investments and united nations office for disaster risk reduction so there are so many organizations remember the important ones and remember which are related to united nations at least remember the unisdr that is the united nations office for the disaster risk reduction and then also remember that resilience so resilience means it is the insurance only so whenever we speak of resilience it is like the proofing of the sufferings so who does that insurance and goals of this gri offer global open reference index data using the metrics built on insurance risk modeling principles so by taking the data of insurance companies so we are going to assess the vulnerability of human lives and also the global environment and provide shared standards to a wide range of users including the corporate climate risk disclosure and national adaptation planning and reporting and the planning of pre-arranged humanitarian finance so for all the financing activities and for the national planning and also to assess corporate risks so we are going up with the global resilience index initiative so here all you need to remember is this is very much related to the insurance and the insurance database is used and some of the important organizations then the carbon border adjustment mechanism the cbam it is a part of european union's ambitious target of reducing 55 percent of carbon emissions compared to 1990 levels by 2030 so remember friends it is a part of european union and it is not associated with any united nations body and it is also called as fit for 55 initiative so remember this keyword and also remember it is not a un initiative then it is pushing for the world's first carbon border tax on imported goods from 2026 
So that means even the transfer of carbon footprints from border to border is being taxed now, and it seeks to address the carbon leakages. So remember the word carbon leakages. That is the companies decam to places with cheaper pollution costs and looser climate regulations. So there they will be having less carbon taxes and others, and they can export the goods from there. But now that is not a chance because as and when the goods reach the border, the additional tax will be charged. Then the carbon border tax is a tax on carbon emissions imposed on imported goods from countries with less strict climate policies. So the sentence is self-explanatory, and then it aims to create a level playing field between imports and the domestic production. So remember the carbon border adjustment mechanism of European Union, and also remember what is carbon leakage, and also what is carbon border tax. Then come to next the CRISP M. So UN Minister of Rural Development and Panchayat Raj jointly launched the CRISP M tool. So CRISP M means Climate Resilience Information System and Planning Tool for MG Narega. So friends, don't confuse CRISP M with the CRISPR Cas9. So it helps in integration of climate information in the GIS. So what kind of information? It is the watershed planning related information under MG Narega. So whatever MG Narega is carrying out, so the watershed programs carried out under that scheme, so that will be integrated under this CRISP M mechanism. So that means where should a panchayat invest the MG Narega fund? So where to build a watershed or how to control a watershed that is being destroyed? So all these plans and all these fundings will be integrated under this CRISP M, and this tool is used in seven states wherein the government of UK and India is jointly working towards climate resilience. And then this tool is used in seven states, and also government of UK and India they are jointly working towards climate resilience. So UK is also helping us, and the states are Bihar, Jharkhand, UP. Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Odisha, and Rajasthan. So, friends, here remember what is this CRISP M and how it is different and what function it does. So, it only integrates the database in the MG Narega about the watershed development. So, mark this watershed and MG Narega and integration of climate information. So, these four keywords they form the crux of this initiative. Then, the climate equity monitor. So, it is an online dashboard for assessing the equity in the climate action. That means the The level playing field between the developing and developed countries, then inequalities in emissions and energy and resource consumption across the world at the international level. So all those equity, so that is being measured, and it is developed by independent researchers from India, and it is aimed at monitoring the performance of Annex One parties under the UNFCC. So Annex One means it is basically the developed countries, and based on the equity and principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. And the performance and policies of non-annex one parties will also be provided for the comparison. So here it is like, friends, we know that the developed countries they always come up with their own reports that I am doing this, I am doing that for the environment and others. And now India has come up with a report saying that so you are being not doing so much, and actually developing countries they are doing much more than you. So this is a voice of developing countries in the climate action. Then come to next the water and climate coalition. Water and Climate Coalition is a multi-stakeholder initiative to provide tangible action, activities, and policy support for integrated water and climate agenda, and it gives a special focus on data information monitoring, etc. So basically, this is an initiative which gets us to the safe use of water and also make sure that by using the water safely, we are curbing the climate change. And this Water and Climate Coalition is open for a wide range of members from the scientific organizations. Private sectors, NGOs, UN organizations, governments, and civil societies, and its secretariat is hosted within the World Meteorological Organization. So remember the coalition, and remember WMO is helping it in day-to-day administration. Then come to next the Special Climate Change Fund and the Least Development Countries Fund. So first GEF, that is the Global Environmental Facility, it has served as an operating entity of the financial mechanism since its entry into force in 1994. And it manages two funds. So these two funds, the SCCF and the LDCF, so these are managed by the GEF, and it is a financial manager which is specialized in that sector, and that is why it has been established. So mark the importance of GEF. And now coming to the Special Climate Change Fund. So this was established in 2001 to finance projects relating to adoption, technology transfer, capacity building, and economic diversification. So basically, technology, human resource, all these things are taken up by this and the least development countries fund. So this was established to support a work program to assist the least developed countries parties carry out national adoption program of action. So friends, every LDCs they have agreed to come up with 
the national adaptation program of actions and in the previous report we have seen that approximately 79% of the nations they have this national plan of actions and to pursue this plan of actions the ldcf is set up then come to next the adaptation fund so this was established in 2001 and to finance concrete adoption projects and programs in developing countries who are parties to Kyoto Protocol that are particularly vulnerable to adverse effect of climate change. So here, my friends, adaptation fund is for developing countries and also for the parties of Kyoto Protocol. So mainly for the non-annex one countries, it is being then the Green Climate Fund. So it was established in the Conference of Party 16, COP 16 in 2010, and developed countries had pledged to mobilize a US dollar of 100 billion per year by 2020 to support developing countries raise and realize their nationally determined contributions. So this is not being observed right now. So they have promised like every year they will deposit some 100 billion dollars under this Green Climate Fund. Then come to next Clean Technology Fund and Climate Investment Funds. So Clean Technology Fund, it aims at empowering transformation in developing countries by providing resources to scale up low carbon technologies. So as the name suggests, wherever there are technological upgradations for the reduction in the emission of carbon dioxide, they are being funded by this fund. Then climate investment funds. So it aims to accelerate climate action by empowering transformations in clean technology, energy access, climate resilience and sustainable forests in developing and middle income countries. So that means this climate investment fund, it will fund the investments by the developing countries for the green climate technologies. So remember the difference, this is technology and this is the investment. So initial investments are provided here. So this can give for R&D also. Then come to next, the state of cities climate finances. So the report was released by the cities climate finance leadership alliance. So remember, this is the name of the report and this is the alliance which is coming up with the report. And it is also being partnered by the World Bank. And the cities climate finance leadership alliance, it is a coalition of leaders committed to deploying finance for city level climate action by 2030. So here remember, this has nothing to do with the United Nations. So it is just a coalition of leaders, coalition of some nations. And then it is the only multi-level and multi-stakeholder coalition aimed at closing the investment gap for urban sub-national climate projects and infrastructures worldwide. So here it is not the national level financing, but the sub-national level financing. So that means it can give funds directly to the state governments, not only to the central governments. And it is the only such finance alliance that is currently in place right now. Then coming to the highlights of the report, the urban climate finance flows are heavily concentrated in the OECD countries and China. So that means whatever financing is being given for the urban climate finance, so that is being concentrated only to the OECD countries and to the China. So nothing for Asia, Africa and others. Then vastly insufficient finances were invested in developing economies like South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Then finance for adoption projects amounted to 9% of investments tracked at the project level in 2017-18 representing against 91% of mitigation and the dual users. So that means for the urban project only 9% of the funds are given and for mitigation and dual users. So friends here dual users means it is something like hybrid vehicles which can run both in petrol as well as electric. So for such 91% of funds are going. But for urban infrastructure, that is urban clean and green infrastructure, only 9% of the fund is going. So that means here the urban investment is being very, very less. So that is what the report says. So here just remember the reports and the alliance and overall the clean urban financing is very less and it is also concentrated over OECD and China. Then the Children's Climate Risk Index. So it is released by UNICEF, so but obvious the Children's Emergency Fund. So the report presents an initial assessment at a global level of the children's exposure and vulnerability to climate and environmental hazards in order to help prioritize the action for those most at the risk. So friends, we need not get into complexities. It is like the vulnerability of children to the climate risk is being indexed. Then the report introduces the CCRA which ranks countries based on how vulnerable the children are for the environmental stressors. And friends, the report also gives some recommendations that is increase investment so that the children will be saved from the climate risks and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, then provide climate education to the children and include young people in the decision making and ensure pandemic recovery is inclusive. So inclusive means even for the poorer people, we should provide clean facilities in the COVID-19 relief works. Then come to next, the Central African Republic tops the index out of 163 countries. 
and Pakistan with 14th rank, Bangladesh 15th rank, Afghan 25, India 26 are the four South Asian countries where children are at extremely high risk of the impact of climate crisis. Then some of the other highlights, children are more vulnerable than adults and globally approximately 1 billion children, that is nearly half of all children are at extremely high risk of the impacts of climate change. So here remember the children's climate risk index and also remember the UNICEF and all other statistics are but obvious clear, they are not so extreme. And also remember 1 billion children, so they are vulnerable. Then come to next, the production gap report 2021. So this is also from UNEP, so we got 3 reports from UNEP. So cross check and revise that. Then report measures the gap between the government's planned production of fossil fuels and the global production levels consistent with the meeting of the Paris Agreement temperature limits, that is 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. So again, it is the gap which we are measuring, that is going with the current pace of production to what level we will produce the fossil fuels and in order to limit, so what we ought to produce. Then as the countries set net zero emissions targets and increase their climate ambitions under Paris Agreement, they have not explicitly recognized or planned for the rapid reduction in fossil fuel production that these targets will require. So friends, they are speaking of net zero emission, they are planning for the solar mission and then they are keeping good good targets for generating renewable energy, but the curbing of fossil fuel is not taking place. So along with the renewable energy, we should also stop the use of non-renewable energy as well. Then the world's governments plan to produce around 110% more fossil fuels in 2030 than, than that would be consistent with this 1.5 degrees Celsius. So compared to what we have to produce to limit the temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius, if we go with the current pace, so we will be ending up producing 110% more than this and 35% more than the consistent 2 degrees Celsius. So again, if we are contemplating the 2 degrees Celsius, so that means we end up producing 45% more than that ought to be required to limit the temperature to 2 degrees Celsius. So here friends, give importance to the report and the organization and also the gap which we are being speaking in all these statements. So that is all about today. Then come to the last part, friends. So whenever we speak of indices and others, so it is like Many organizations are clogging our brain with so many reports, indices and others. And environment speaks about the de-stressing of the living beings. But learning environment itself has become a stressful job now. So friends here, rely on your instincts and guessworks. So don't try to buy hard too much. And make sure that you will smartly take up the guessworks even when you attempt the mock test. So make sure that your guessing strategies will be fine-tuned more. So don't squeeze your brain by feeding more and more things and work smartly. So do it all the very best. Good luck friends.